So I, uh, to get into the topic, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Italian politics, particularly those after the early 90s, uh, after the Cold War. Um, and I'm going to stop a little bit short of kind of current uh, Italian politics. Uh, Italy has a very long storied history uh, of different political uh, things, you know, starting well, starting long back, but from the Red Biennium in 1920-1921, where worker activity was at uh, a real, real high peak, um, that was wiped out uh, pretty soon after that by Mussolini's fascism. Uh, then we see, like in the 1970s, uh, the the largest communist party in the West uh, was in Italy, and then today, uh, it's largely a country dominated by kind of center left technocrats. Uh, far right populists, uh, you know, there's not really a, a large uh, organized left uh, in the country. Uh, I can't possibly cover all of that um, in the time we have tonight. So I'm going to kind of pick and choose, um, hopefully, uh, to give you an idea of why I think Italy is worth studying as American socialists and what we can get out of it. Uh, so I want to start with a little brief historical note, uh, last Thursday, uh, January 21st, was the 100th anniversary of the formation of the Italian Communist Party. Um, at that time, it was the Communist Party of Italy. It was a section of the Communist International. Uh, they changed the name to the Italian Communist Party in 1943 uh, after fascism fell, and they, they grew uh, to 2.3 million members. Uh, they were the largest uh, party uh, like I said, largest communist party in the West. I don't have a whole lot more to say about them at this at this current moment uh, in in the presentation, but I wanted to shout out because it was such a uh, a, a nice timing with their with their anniversary. Um, and as we will see, their demise uh, led to some pretty bad consequences in Italy. Um, yeah. So this is uh, what we're going to talk about uh, for the most part tonight. Uh, why Italy is important. Um, give you some historical context and what we can learn from it. Um, hopefully I'll cover enough for you to get an idea uh, of what I'm talking about. But like I said, there's a whole lot here that I won't be able to cover. And if you find this interesting, um, a lot of the, the points that I'm going to be, be talking about are directly from this book. Uh, it came out last year uh, from Verso by David Broder. He's a uh, Jacobin editor in Europe. He's a historian of uh, largely Italian and French uh, history. And this book's really good. It gives a, I think, really uh, good level of kind of high, high and low level um, history and context into why Italy is like it is. Uh, so this is a quote from the uh, book. He says, uh, today Italy's institutional turmoil is rather less a mark of backwardness and more like a vision of our own future. Um, so this is from the introduction in the book. Um, yes, uh, as Rachel puts in the chat, David is a friend. I DM'd him on Twitter a couple weeks ago and he answered questions and he's a very nice man. And I would uh, recommend if you have uh, things to ask him to reach out. Um, so this is from the introduction. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people, I think you kind of hear, this was probably more prominent like 10 years ago when Berlusconi was uh, kind of still a bigger figure, but people talked about how Italy was this kind of like uniquely messed up country where there was just wild, crazy stuff happening and no other country was like that. Um, but Broder's point that he makes through a lot of this book is really that um, it's not so unique and that it should be seen more of a, as a warning to a lot of other wealthy Western countries, um, particularly particularly those that are dealing with debt crises, with aging populations, uh, high unemployment, uh, capitalist parties that are more dysfunctional than functional. Um, so he sees Italy as, as really a source for, uh, for lessons for us. And I think that that is true uh, as well. So wh why should we even look at Italy at all? Um, I think that there are some, uh, as Americans specifically, I think that there are some um, kind of uh, shades of um, American politics and Italian politics kind of reflect each other. Um, one theme that you see over and over in recent Italian history is this conflation of public and private interests. Um, as we see uh, Berlusconi, um, who was, if you don't know of uh, who he is, he was prime minister several times um, of Italy. He came to power originally in the early 90s. And um, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but basically, uh, it, it was as a business interest more than a like political party interest. 
Um, we also see that parties uh, themselves have become less important and kind of personalities have taken over, which I think is something that we've seen in American politics quite a bit over the last few decades as well. Um, you have people in Italy like Berlusconi, uh, Matteo Salvini, who is the leader of uh, Liga, which is the, the kind of big right party right now, and um, Beppe Grillo, who is a uh, comedian who started the Five Star Movement, which is kind of this populist party I'll talk about more, but they are uh, they are like individuals who are really kind of larger than the parties. Um, Salvini like is this big like online guy who communicates a lot through like Facebook and Twitter and things like that. Um, you know, comparable I think to people like Trump in their communication styles in their kind of uh, rejection of traditional media. Um, yeah, and I just, I think that we've seen a lot more of that uh, recently in America and that it, it spells not good things for working people. Um, also, I want to note that in 1993, there were some changes in electoral law in Italy that changed the way that represent, representation uh, or representatives were elected. Um, it was explicitly designed to create this binary system of a center left and center right, uh, very similar to the American uh, way of things. And at the time, the center left actually supported this because they knew that um, what the outcome of this would be is that they could blackmail uh, anyone to their left into supporting the broader center left coalition because if they they said you know if we split the vote then the right's going to win and that's something that we see in american politics a lot you know we as socialists are very familiar with being kind of guilted and, and browbeaten into voting for democrats uh even though they don't represent our interests in a lot of cases um, we also see turnout uh, getting a lot worse in Italy as it is in America. Um, in the 70s, uh, turnout was like over 90% uh, in, in general elections in Italy. And I think in the last one in 2018, um, it was more like 72%, like low 70s. So it's dropped by almost a third. Um, and that I think is a symptom of the, the kind of general um, disillusionment, disillusionment with the options that are in front of uh, people. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what happened uh, in the fallout uh, after World War II. Um, so we saw after fascism uh, was defeated, we see decades and decades and decades of Italian government dominated by the Christian Democrats. Um, this is really what you will hear referred to as the First Republic. So this is the time after World War II up to the, the early 90s. Um, they really were this kind of big tent uh, uh, kind of cent centrist um, party, they controlled a lot um, throughout those decades. And in st the, the Communist Party, as I said, was also kind of growing and, and was pretty healthy through a lot of this time period. Um, but instead of gaining power, really what happened was the other parties that weren't communists uh, worked in coalition to kind of block communists from having any control um, and any power. Um, so that's really kind of the underlying history for what happened. Um, later on in the 90s up till now. Um, uh, this is a quote from Broder's book. Uh, the First Republic's dominant forces could divide up posts and influence among themselves, indeed increasingly becoming factions integrated into the sharing of institutional power rather than mass membership parties. Um, really, basically, uh, they were in power. They were kind of able to do whatever they wanted. Uh, there was not much accountability to the actual people who made up the parties, even though they were uh, technically mass membership parties uh, for the most part. So, you know, people were part of the parties. They at least nominally had some democracy in those parties, but it really wasn't actually carried out uh, in government very much. Um, and so that that led to, um, you know, Italy did pretty well uh, through a lot of those uh, that time period, you know, they there was a rapid industrialization, uh, they their economy was doing largely pretty well, uh, Italian standard of living was pretty high throughout a lot of that time. Um, and then the early 90s happened. And uh, this is really the kind of crucial turning point for what exists in Italy today. Um, and a lot of that was kind of triggered by the end of the Cold War, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the subsequent dis dissolution of the Communist Party, uh, right? Because there was no more uh, Soviet Union, so there was no more Communist Party. Um, they, those kind of went hand in hand. And uh, as the PCI, the Communist Party collapsed, um, as I said before, 
there were all these decades where the Communist Party was like, uh, I think in the book he describes it as one side of the wall and the other dominant parties were the other side of the wall and they were kind of holding up the status quo uh, by pushing against each other. And one side one, and once one side fell, the other side fell as well. And so what ended up happening is that when there wasn't this Communist Party to kind of unite all of the other forces, they started sniping at each other. And so what this led to was um, actually a huge series of arrests and exposure of um, bribery scandals. Uh, so you, you, you might hear, uh, hear this called the clean hands um, process. And basically this was a huge media um, uh, frenzy uh, where they televised uh, court proceedings and they they showed uh, tons of of very visible politicians in Italy um, being arrested and tried for for corruption scandals uh, of various types. Most of them were these things that they call kickback schemes, which are basically politicians who got uh, some um, some money a kickback in exchange for awarding public money to to companies for you know private bid or for um, public projects and things like that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, in 1992, uh, Mario Chiesa was arrested and uh, this one, so this was like the first big name uh, who got arrested. And I think it's particularly uh, f kind of funny because when he was arrested, uh, he actually tried to run into the bathroom and he had about 20,000 euro, uh, well, not euros at the time, but the equivalent of 20,000 euros. And he tried to hide it in a toilet uh, in the bathroom, which I, I think is kind of funny and uh, kind of shows the, the kind of ridiculousness of uh, what was going on at the time. Uh, so this kept going. Um, kind of what happened, there were kind of two responses um, in large part. Uh, one, the ruling parties and the individuals involved really tried to protect themselves from this. Uh, there were uh, in parliament at the time, there were uh, investigations blocked. Um, there was really a complete failure to take accountability for any of this from the party's perspective. Um, most of the leaders at that time tried to attribute all of this to just like bad apples. They tried to say that uh, the people who were being implicated weren't actually um, representative of the, of the government at large. And as time went along, that became more and more untrue. As you saw, uh, the, the corruption scandals kind of spread and spread. You saw pretty much all of the dominant parties be implicated in some way or another. And um, uh, what ended up happening really was <laughs> a, a really bad vacuum in um, kind of political power. Um, the, these were the these are big mainstream parties, like I said, that had that had basically controlled Italian government for 50 years at that point. And so there wasn't a whole lot of um, uh, obvious places for it to go after that. So after 1992, there was uh, there were elections and um, this is where we start to see the rise of some of the parties, uh, specifically League and Nord, um, which at the time it was this kind of northern regional party, um, uh, hard right party, they were, uh, they often at that time, one of their big issues was that the southern Italy was full of lazy people who were just leeches off of the uh, northern Italy's great industrialism. Um, and then we also see MSI, which was the post-fascist party, the kind of far right party. Uh, they, they made huge gains. They won a, a, a huge amounts of votes in Rome, in Naples, in Milan, um, in the fallout of the, of the clean hands um, investigations. These were, I mean, these were parties that were, that were kind of fringe. Uh, and then over the course of two years became the dominant political forces in the country uh, because these, these big old parties, including the Communist Party, which like I said, uh, dissolved. And then all of the center left parties uh, got taken down by uh, the clean hands investigations. And so you see these right parties begin to take shape. Um, the new left kind of big coalition party was called the uh, Democratic Party of the Left, PDS. Um, they were the ones that kind of took the place of the uh, Christian Democrats in, in large part. Um, so I wanted to show this picture. Uh, this was the Prime Minister uh, Croxy. I don't actually know how to pronounce that. Uh, if anyone knows, feel free to, to chime in. But anyways, he was, he was the... Uh, Prime Minister, and he, 
he was implicated in the clean in the clean hands investigations and he was welcomed uh, by a crowd of protesters that threw coins at him and said uh, why don't you take these two uh, i just thought that that was a, a good protest tactic and i wanted to highlight the picture uh, because i think that's it's a good way to, to take it to these people So uh, around this time is also where we see one of the main figures of Italian politics in in largely our lifetimes. In in you know if you're if you're like thirty and under, um, Berlusconi was uh, and has been kind of the face of Italian politics up until relatively recently. Um, and this is really when he really started to enter into the scene. Um, he, like I said, he was, um, uh, well, maybe I didn't say this, but he, he was afraid of being implicated in the clean hands um, investigations. I think he, he knew what was coming. He also had connections to a lot of um, kind of organized crime, but he was this, he was this uh, rich uh, TV mogul, basically. He owned a lot of media. He owned um, some of the large television networks that weren't uh, public television in Italy. And he had been kind of working prior to this in the 80s and, and, um, and 90s to kind of erode the public goods in Italy in order to benefit himself. Um, he got licenses. For example, he got licenses for his television networks um, that other folks weren't able to get. Um, and so he he had kind of a couple big reasons to enter to politics. One, I think he realized there was going to be this big gaping vacuum of power, and he knew that he could step in. Um, but he also knew that he needed to protect himself. Um, and this is like one of the places where you get a little bit of uh, uh, shades of Trump, uh, I think, where, um, yeah, he realized that he could personally utilize power. and. Uh, he didn't go out and just say that, obviously. He couldn't just say, oh, I'm running because uh, I need to protect myself uh, from being arrested. Um, and so he really made it into this, uh, this idea where he needed to stop the communists. And that was a big theme of his rhetoric early on. Um, you, see, you see him refer to basically everyone in his coalition as the, the good Christian liberals. And if you're not uh, with them, you're a communist. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the kind of rhetoric that we see, I think, pretty often uh, in American politics today. Um, but he also, I think, notably uh, leveraged his identity as an outsider as well, which is another place I think Trump um, either <laughs> directly or indirectly learned from him by, uh, you know, saying like, hey, I'm this businessman. We've got this decaying government that uh, we, we just need some business acumen in here to really figure out how to make the numbers line up. Uh, you know, I haven't been, I'm not a bribe. I haven't taken bribes. I haven't been in office. I haven't been um, uh, a beneficiary of these problems that have been happening. Uh, so I can really come in and, um, and, and make things right. I, I mean, you go back if you want, you should go read this, the original speech he gave. Um, when he announced his initial run for office. And it really reads a lot like we need to drain the swamp and stop the communists. Uh, it's it's kind of wild uh, how closely it aligns with that. Um, so Broder says that uh, the entrepreneur's decision to take to the field and particularly his way of presenting it also aug augured a new era in Italian politics characterized by the cult of the reticent popular hero. Uh, so he, he also had this kind of like sheepish uh, you know, like, I don't really want to be running. I don't really want to do this, but, you know, someone has to, someone has to save, save us all. So uh, he, 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 his party, which um, you may have heard of it. Uh, it was a giant, pretty uh, um, successful major party for, for quite a few years was Forza Italy. Um, it was very different than parties that had, had existed up till that point in Italy. Um, even even the parties that, uh, like I said, uh, in the 80s and 90s had kind of become this um, uh, cartel of handing out positions and kind of delegating things however they wanted without accountability. Even those parties still at least nominally had like some membership. They had uh, like party congresses where they elected party leaders and things like that. Forza Italia had none, or Forza, Forza Italia had none of that. Um, 
Berlusconi chose all of the own, his own candidates. Uh, there were no local branches. There were no internal elections. Uh, he, he did whatever he wanted. It was a one man show. Um, and in 1994, uh, his coalition uh, won massively. Again, this is in the fallout of the clean hand scandals. Um, and uh, he, they took 43% uh, uh, of the vote, which um, in Italy's system is is a lot. Uh, they won 16.6 million votes. Uh, the left-wing coalition, um, which was uh, headed by PDS, uh, only won about 34% of the votes. Uh, they won you know, about 9% less. And uh, the Christian Democrats, who, like I said, had been the ruling party for almost 50 years, only won 16% of the vote. So you see, over the course of two years, so 1992 was the first clean hands arrest, and then 1994 were these elections. In the course of just two years, the largest party for five decades uh, suddenly receded into um, a minority party of only 16% of the vote, uh, which is pretty crazy swing in that short of a time. And it's hard to imagine something like that happening uh, in a country as developed as that. Um, but that goes to show how deep that the bribery scandals really took, uh, or how deep the uh, how deep they deeply they were felt rather. Um, and I think that uh, you know, as I keep talking, you'll see that that it it is a symptom of this kind of disillusionment and. Um, complete lack of, of faith in, in those uh, parties to really do anything for, for people's interests. Um, so this is a picture of Mr. Berlusconi with his Forza Italia uh, party logo in the back. Um, yeah, he's quite a guy. Uh, just look at him. Uh, yeah, he looks like Clay, uh, exactly. I don't know, I just kind of enjoy looking at him. Just gonna take a second. He's just like so wild to look at. Anyways, uh, moving on. Uh, so I want to pause for a second, and um, you know, you might be wondering where are the class politics here, right? Like, like I mentioned at the top, Italy has a rich history of uh, left parties. Uh, they there was incredibly high. Uh, uh, yeah, you should read what Rachel's writing in the chat. Rachel is, knows a lot about, uh, <laughs> yeah, Italian history. Uh, yeah, Miro was murdered. Uh, yeah, a, a lot to go into there. Um, the first line of the Italian constitution is Italy is a democratic republic founded on labor. And I just wanted to call that out because of how starkly uh, saying we are a republic founded on labor and then turning around and and looking at the last 20 or 30 years where a extremely wealthy businessman uh, largely ran the country and then uh, after he started to fade away uh, technocrats ran the country certainly not labor certainly not workers um, and I think that a lot of this goes to um, goes to show that if you don't have uh, people in who are vying for political power, who actually are creating their political platform on collective interests and you know on on socialism, um, then it leads you just to really bleak places. Um, this is the way Broder puts it. He says Italian politics are becoming less defined by unifying cultural visions or even collective material demands as by a transactional relationship between the atomized citizen and the state. Um, you know, the, yeah, it, it's just, uh, it's it's really kind of shocking when you look at the Italian history and then, and then where they were at, at this point in time. So, um, I wanted to also uh, moving moving along a little bit. Forza Italia, uh, you know, they took over. They did a lot of um, uh, privatizations, um, but we also see the growth of Liga Nord at this time. Um, this is uh, the party I mentioned that was the kind of northern um, regional party. They actually grew out of a lot of smaller parties that were were even more regional. Um, they were based in in the north where. They had um, 
they had really strong little groups of party members in kind of smaller towns in in kind of the kind of more uh, mountainous hill country uh they were built on actual uh cadre structures and they kind of um Actually, Broder describes it as kind of a Leninist model, if you're familiar with how uh, Lenin saw parties um, being built. And um, I think that's interesting because it, it let them have this sort of, um, um, uh, they, they, they didn't do great in all of the elections from 1994 you know, up, up until 2000, into the 2000s when they started to grow again. They actually lost quite a bit, but they were able to maintain their party structures because they were built like on actual party members. They had like really strong infrastructure. And I think that's um, obviously there's a lot of reasons you can't compare that directly to American and America, America's politics. But I think that's like an, an interesting lesson that if you actually um, base your party and your political organization in people and not these kind of ephemeral, ephemeral um, media apparatuses, which is what a lot of other parties were turning to at the time, yeah, they were kind of secessionist. And that's actually, I was going to talk about that. In the in the mid-90s, one of the things that kept them uh, afloat uh, when they were losing was that they made this turn to Padanian independence. Padania is another name for Northern Italy. They actually like ran on um, this idea that Northern Italy should secede, that they are just being uh, brought down and dragged down by Southern Italy. And as time went on, this uh, it became clear that, uh, no, don't apologize, that... Uh, that they uh, weren't going to make huge progress uh, with that line. Um, it wasn't a hugely popular uh, idea, especially um, to people outside of their region, obviously. Um, and so this ended up turning into kind of really nasty anti-immigration rhetoric. Um, and this is what you see more. Uh, yeah, Eurozone politics in miniature for sure. Uh, this is what we see more today is that is this uh, really strong anti-immigration um, they did some real nasty stuff around this. Uh, one I wanted to draw attention to because just as an example, they, they put up election posters with uh, a picture of a Native American and the slogan, they didn't control immigration, now they live on reserves. Uh, which if you just think about that is so deeply uh, uh, perverse. Um, yeah, just give you a snapshot into the kind of uh, politics that they trade in. Um, I wanted to bring them up because uh, they're still a um, a massive force. Uh, Matteo Salvini is the current leader uh, of um, of Liga. They were they were actually in a ruling coalition in 2018 into 2019. They're still a big force in the in the country. Um, if there were elections today, you know, it's possible that they would actually be the uh, the, the largest party in power. Um, so I also I want to talk a little bit a little bit about the decline of the left because I think this is where a lot of the lessons for us come into play. Um, like I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, the center left after PCI and PSI went away um, really became this kind of liberal. You could stretch and say social democracy uh, kind of politics, but it was really this politics uh, of capitalism and not of worker power in any way. Um, a lot of the uh, folks that were in power in the center left parties that took over after the PCI and PSI went away were were like technocrats. They were uh, people who were just experts. They weren't actually political leaders in any way. Um, in 2007, so the, the current uh, kind of center left party is called the Democratic Party. And it was created in 2007, directly inspired by the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party of, uh, of the US, which gives you an idea of kind of what they thought was um, uh, uh, sorry, what they thought was uh, the way to go, you know, if they're looking at the world political landscape and they see you know this is pre right before obama so there was i guess kind of a height of the democratic party maybe uh at that point but anyways they they created a party to directly mimic that um i you might uh be thinking well that's pretty far from uh communist marxism uh that dominated uh the italian left politics for a long time before that and you would be correct uh, it's very different and it means that there's this kind of um, 
hole where a lot of the left parties are very small. Uh, actual Marxists are um, in very fringe parties at this point. Um, yeah, uh, one thing uh, that's another Broder quote down here at the bottom, uh, today's Democratic Party is a party of the liberal middle classes existing for the purpose of electoral competition alone, which that sentence, the reason I pulled that one out in particular is because you could say that about the American Democratic Party, and I think you'd be pretty much right on. Three decades of economic woe, discredited institutions, and declining parties have undermined popular faith in political action, creating a scorched earth situation in which the forces of the left are unable to articulate any positive vision of Italy's future. This quote, I think, really gets to the heart of what I want people to like take away from, from what I'm talking about uh, and why I think that DSA is important and organized socialism in, in, um, in the US is important. Because I think that, you know, you see people like Bernie who come and uh, are hugely popular and uh, they, they are not really part of, well, yeah, they're not part of the democratic in establishment um, like other people who, who are part of the Democratic Party. And you see, I, I think, similar, uh, um, a similar dynamic forming, right? Where the Democratic Party, I think, uh, as it kind of limps or limps along with Biden in power now, uh, I think we're at risk of running into a very similar situation where, and if, if we're not already, uh, where most people uh, don't really see political power as something that can change their lives. They don't see a, a they don't see the conditions as changeable. They see these their shitty lives as something that that can't change. Um, and I think that it just leads to really bleak places. And that's why I think that uh, DSA has to win, uh, because I think if we don't win, then then we end up here. Um, yeah, this is a little bit more of what I was talking about with uh, the left's reaction to Berlusconi, you know, instead of instead of saying, oh, no, this is a rich businessman who is just stealing from you to make himself wealthier to protect him from uh, which, well, he didn't actually get protected uh, from all corruption charges. He eventually was um, uh, convicted, but only a couple years ago, like very recently. He, he was in power for a long time before any of that happened. But anyways, they could have done that uh, at first, but instead uh, the Italian left really reacted by like putting bankers in charge. Um, they, they abandoned Marxism. Yeah, this is mostly stuff that I talked about already. Um, the, uh, but I do, there's one thing I do want to point out on the slide, which is the bottom point. Um, the PDS, which is the, the left party that kind of uh, came up in the aftermath of clean hands, they did not have any kind of mass party democracy. And this is another thing that I really value about DSA is that uh, we don't have just an inability to uh, impact uh, our organization. You know, we have internal elections, we vote on our priorities, we vote on our leaders. Uh, the PDS didn't do that. And it really kind of uh, cut off, I think, a lot of people's uh, buy-in into the, into the party that they, that they were members of. So they were unable to like see themselves as, as a member. And it just led to this disconnected um, uh, party that wasn't serving the interests of the people that it nominally was. Um, yeah, I guess uh, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that the PCI really was um, a communist party that uh, held Marxism really central to, to what it did. Um, they were able to integrate demands from white collar workers, from sh small shop owners, from farmers. Um, and that led to the PCI having really massive success. You know, that, that leads to a large electoral base if you can really integrate all those demands into one. Uh, some might call it uh, working class demands. Um, and also the PCI like wasn't ever fully included in government. Like I said, they were, they were blocked from a lot of government positions. They weren't able to become ministers of a lot of important uh, aspects of the Italian government. And so as a result of that, they actually continued to organize outside of government in a way that um, the other parties didn't do, right? Because they had government positions. So they saw their, their actions as uh, political leaders was running things. And so instead, uh, instead of organizing people and um, 
uh, doing things like shop floor campaigns that the PCI was involved in. There, there's a lot of Italian worker actions that led to uh, massive reform wins, even when the PCI didn't have control over the government. And I think that's uh, um, another important lesson for us, right? Like winning government seats is not the magic bullet that actually changes things. You also have to uh, continue to organize people and understand where the power comes from, which is in workers and worker activity, not in um, you know bureaucratic decisions. Uh, yeah, this is a, a quote that goes into that a little bit more. Retaining a specifically communist rather than social democratic identity, the PCI married a vague uh, future promise of socialism with the community built around the party and the reforms achieved in the present from free public transport to the generous payments for industrial workers made redundant. Uh, so they really had this, this long-term vision uh, that socialism uh, could actually win. Um, so I, I think I'm uh, probably running real long on time. I'm going to uh, skip a little bit through this. Uh, this, this the things that are happening to Italy now um, is that it's really been a victim of the debt crisis that we've seen across a lot of Europe. Uh, Greece, Spain, Portugal, if you read anything about the European debt crisis, you'll see that Italy uh, was one of the most indebted countries among those. It's really kind of a complicated issue. I am not uh, an expert in it, so I'm not going to attempt to explain a lot of it. But uh, suffice to say the, that Italy is kind of constrained in their ability to respond to the debt crisis because, uh, in part, the European Central Bank actually controls a lot of that fluid uh, liquidity, rather. Um, and so it's like the, the ECB, the European Central Bank, uh, forced them to privatize public goods, forced them to lower public employee wages in order to uh, to get out of their debts or to to get more money, at least to to continue the uh, the kind of money train flowing. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's important to kind of understand what's happening now and why you see kind of Euro skepticism in Italy rivaling that of uh, uh, of England, uh, which obviously resulted in Brexit. Uh, just briefly, the Five Star Movement is this populist party. Uh, so this is one of the main parties now. And the reason I think that it's important for us to kind of understand where the Five Star Movement came from and why I don't have time to go into it, but they're this populist party that really took uh, politics as its target. Like they're a political party. They didn't have a positive vision. Like I, like I just said in, the, in, in that slide before, there, there's no one giving this positive vision of, of what could change. They were just saying, these are the people who are bringing us down. These are the cast of politicians that are really uh, stopping us um, and, 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 and stealing from us. But they didn't have any, um, any real change uh, to suggest. But I think it's also interesting, you know, like I said, Beppe Grillo is this, this individual. He's a comedian. Um, kind of make, making a mockery of people in power and it ended up kind of catapulting his uh, party to to uh, quite a bit of power. But they all they prioritized the internet and independent media in, in this transition. I think there's some lessons for us to learn about how effective that is uh, versus traditional media. Um, you know, populists uh, aren't the only ones who can uh, utilize those things. I think the left can learn from that. Uh, and also when they won power, like they were, they had, uh, the majority uh, in the government, and they didn't really know what to do with it. They they didn't actually weren't actually able to make things better because that's not what they had. That's not what was central to their politics. Yeah, free water and free internet. Yeah, that's uh, that's about where it ends, though, as far as I know. Uh, the, this is a, um, another quote about Grillo. The radical tone of Grillo's communications was often married to a tepid promise of actual changes, it being assumed that the European architecture was both unreformable and here to stay. And that's kind of like the fact that this is unreformable and here to stay is really kind of the backing for a lot of the current um, uh, Italian political leaders uh, of all parties. They really all kind of operate under that assumption. So right now, uh, fast forwarding to today, skipping some steps in there, um, the, the governments that I skipped of kind of the last 10 years have largely been technical governments, which means that they're, they're uh, not political governments, they're made of technocrats who are supposed to kind of use their expertise to manage things. They're supposed to be good managers, not good, pol or not good political decision makers. Um, and that has led to a lot of more fragility in the coalitions that have formed um, because there aren't, you know, like 
strong politics backing a lot of this. Everything's like really kind of fragile. This week, yesterday, uh, the prime minister resigned because uh, he lost his majority coalition uh, last week when um, a small party withdrew from the coalition. So I don't have a whole lot to say on that except for to say like this continues to be the way things are going in Italy, even when they are one of the heaviest struck countries in the world by COVID, uh, they still can't keep it together. Um, uh, in 2018, uh, Liga, which is the, the right party and the Five Star Movement uh, formed a coalition and the, the current prime minister, Giuseppe Conte, uh, actually isn't a part of any of these parties. He was chosen as kind of this unity guy who he's like a lawyer uh, who is not a politician at all. They just thought, oh, he can he can run things. He's competent, right? Like competency instead of politics. Um, and uh, because of COVID, it's unlikely that elections are going to happen. So we're probably not going to see a big realignment of anything. They're probably going to form some kind of uh, cobbled together coalition over the next few months. And we'll see maybe uh, Conti can continue to be prime minister. It's uh, This happened yesterday. So I, I don't know what's really going to happen. Yeah, Mayo P. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That I mean, that's exactly the kind of American politics that I, th that I think are dangerous because of what we see in Italy, right? Uh, Pete, even Warren to some degree of this kind of technocrat expertise um, instead of worker politics. Uh, so that was a little bit of scattershot. There's a whole lot in this book that fills in all of these blanks. I would definitely recommend if any part of what I just talked about interests you, go check that book out. It's not that long. Um, Broder is also has uh, excerpts from the book published on Jacobin, and he writes pretty regular, regularly uh, for Jacobin, so you can go find some of his articles there. Okay, sorry that went so long. That's all I have for now. <laughs>